I'll just have to talk really loud. Okay, there we go. <laughs> go ahead and pull out your bulletin. Go ahead and pull out that little flyer. I don't know what that was. It was a ghost in the machine. Go ahead and pull this guy out. I have a question for you. Have you ever been to the mountaintop? Have you ever been to the mountaintop? Go ahead and, what was your last mountaintop experience? Write it on the back of this paper that you've got there in your bulletin. What was your last mountaintop experience? Do you remember your last mountaintop experience? You know, we were, we were camping last weekend and I was gonna hike to the top of that mountain, like right there in Dillingham. And then I woke up that Saturday and figured, I'm not gonna hike to the top of that mountain. I'm just too tired. That's a switchback. That's a, that's a switchback trail up to the top of, that, top of that mountain over there. But what was your last mountaintop experience? And a lot of times we, there's two different kinds of mountaintop experiences that we can have. We can have that physical mountaintop experience where we're hiking to the top of that mountain. Like my brother-in-law just hiked up to that observatory up on Mount Kahala up there. And it's just crazy. He took a picture up there. You're looking down. You can see everything from the top of that mountain. And there's, there's some really nice physical mountains. I mean, I have a picture right here. This is going to be Mike and Kim. I did this just for Mike and Kim. <laughs> yeah, you can turn off the lights if you want. So you can see the picture better. You're like, what is that picture? It's a lot of white and blue. Well, that's Mount of Olives. I hiked the Mount of Olives. And you go up there, and you're at the top, and you have this incredible view of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Mike and Kim are super excited. This is going to be their view. And then, you know, Lisa and Pastor Clay are going to be following them like a month later. And that's going to be their view. They're going to be sitting here, standing and just looking at this amazing, this might be one of the most impressive mountaintops that I've been to. And it's like the Mount of Olives, but it's, it's really a hill. Let's be honest. It's not really a mountain. It's like a little hill. And you, you're up there on the top of it. It doesn't take very long to get to the top. But the, I mean, the Bible, as you're sitting here just standing and looking, into Jerusalem, the Bible is just coming alive. You're on this mountaintop and it's just this amazing experience and you start to realize all the things that have gone on here. But do you know what you have to do when you get to the top of the Mount of Olives? Well, you have to walk back down. And you know what's at the bottom of the Mount of Olives? There's something at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. And I took a picture and Mike and Kim and Lisa and Pastor Clay are gonna be here. It's, it's the valley. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. It's down at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. And this is where Jesus, you guys all know the story, Jesus went to this garden. He went to the garden and he was praying so earnestly that he was sweating great drops of blood. That there was a trial that occurred in this garden. There's a trial that occurred in the valley. And see, there's physical mountains and physical valleys, but there's also spiritual mountains and spiritual valleys. They occur all the time. You know, when we get to those spiritual mountaintops, God does something absolutely amazing. I love Ephesians 3.20. It says, Now to him who is able to do far more or exceedingly abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. We see God on these mountaintops do something absolutely amazing. We get to see it. Maybe we get to even participate in that thing that God is doing. But then there's a time that we have to come back down from that mountain. I mean, every... Daniel and I get to talk every year. Well, we talk every week, but every year it's coming up this year, October, we go to Nepal. And in Nepal, there's such a hunger for the Word of God. And we go to Nepal, and this past year, Daniel got to preach in Nepal. I mean, he's preached in Nepal before, but this was a pretty big camp that he was preaching at. And just this, the boldness that Daniel had in sharing the gospel with these hundreds of kids that were in this camp, it was just absolutely amazing. And then we go back, we come back, to Hawaii. And Hawaii is a beautiful place. And then we talk about it and you say, you know, it's so hard to come back to Hawaii. I just, I'm not sure what it is, but when I get back to Hawaii, that fire that I had in Nepal, it feels like it's just this little ember now. That fire, that passion that I had for the Lord, I'm, it feels like I've gone off of this mountain and into this valley. Because it happens spiritually. We come down. We see that God do something absolutely amazing and we come down and we get discouraged. We wonder, like, man, Lord, what did you do back there? And what are you doing now? I don't, I don't understand what's going on. It happens to each and every one of us. All of us, if we think hard enough, we've had spiritual mountaintop experiences where we've seen the Lord do something. And after those mountaintop experiences, what happens? We go into these valleys. We go down into these valleys and we start to think, man, what's going on in this valley? This is tough. And this is exactly what happens. We're in Acts chapter 11 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Acts chapter 11 because you guys know what happens in Acts chapter 10. P 
Peter goes and he gives the gospel to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit falls on them. Radical salvation is going on. Peter is on the mountaintop. This great experience of the Lord doing something absolutely new and fresh that hadn't been done before. And then what happens? Peter goes back to Jerusalem, back to the church, the elders in the church. And as he goes back to the elders in the church, you would think the elders in the church would be super stoked that God is doing something new. And that's why we have here Acts chapter 11, because we see the elders in the church, they're responding to what Peter had done. Read with me, I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. Let's read the first three verses, Acts chapter 11, verses one through three. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. You went to uncircumcised men. And they heard that the word of God had gone out, but they weren't really caring about the word going out to the Gentiles. They came up to Peter and says, hey, buddy, you went in and you broke our traditions. You went in and you ate with these Gentiles. This news travels so quickly. I mean, you think news travels quickly now. News traveled just as quickly back then. Before Peter even gets to Jerusalem, the news had reached them. One, the Gentiles had been saved. And two, Peter had gone into the house. Peter went into, what, you went into that house? I mean, here was a devout Jewish man. I mean, Peter was a devout Jew. And he went in and he broke the traditions. He even told those guys, what I'm doing is against our is against our law. It's not lawful for me to be here. That's how he started his whole, whole sermon. Hey guys, it's not lawful for me to be here in this place. That's a great way to start a sermon. That was his introduction. But he, he it wasn't lawful for him. You know, they these leaders could not believe that the Gentiles could be saved without first converting to Judaism. Why? Because that was how it had been for thousands of years. To come to God, you had to first come to Judaism. You had to obey all the laws to come to God, and then you could approach the Lord. They couldn't believe that Jesus is doing something new. And so as soon as Peter gets there, they corner this guy, hey, what are you doing, man? You're going in to eat with these Gentiles. You're breaking the law. He's gone from this mountaintop experience down into a valley, the valley where all these people are. They're accusing him of different things. And how is Peter going to respond to this? I love his response because his response is a twofold experience. Response. You might read it and say, well, he just does one thing. He actually does two things. The first thing he does is he tells these guys, this is what happened. And then, this is the thing I love about Peter's response. He not only kept, recounts for them the things that happened, he tells them his thoughts about what had happened. He shares with them his thoughts. So once again, we have this amazing event. I want you to notice there's, it's just a recounting of what we learned in Acts chapter 10. But look at the four things that God does. Because God is the one that orchestrates the events that happen in our lives. God is the one that orchestrates all of these events. And so what happens? We're going to read uh, verses 4 through 10. Read with me. It's so interesting. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. He says, I'm going to tell you the order of the way this happened. Uh, this happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in a trance, I saw a vision, something like a great sheep descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and all was drawn up again into heaven. Peter sees the sheep. I went and I actually looked for my old picture Bible to find that picture. That was my favorite story in the picture Bible. You guys that are old like me, you remember the picture Bible. It was red, hardcover, and it was awesome. You could read that, all the pictures in it. I love that thing. I read that thing over and over and over again. My favorite story was the story. Because you could, they had this picture of the sheet and all these animals are like falling out of it. And so I went to look and I, I thought like my daughters had a picture Bible. We do. I couldn't find the picture Bible, but I found the action Bible. They've changed it now. It's no longer the picture Bible. It's like this action Bible. The art is all updated. And I'm like, I like the old art better. I don't like this newfangled art and show. And so I had the sheet and these crocodile, this stuff was coming out. I still love that story. But, but notice here, Peter, being a devout Jew, would never have touched these animals. And he tells that to the Lord. I've never, I've never touched this stuff. I'm a devout Jew. I've never touched it. Do you see what he says? <laughs> 
I can see myself in Peter because look at Peter's response to God. By no means, Lord. Right there in verse 8. Do you see those, those words? By no means, one word, one little phrase, and then there was a second phrase, Lord. By no means, Lord. Well, see, here's the problem. Here's why I can see myself in Peter. We call God Lord, and yet we refuse to do the things that he asks us to do. Peter's sitting there able to call God Lord, and yet refusing to do the things that God asks him to do. He knows that this command is from God. He calls the voice Lord. He knows that God is telling him to do something, and he says, nope, I'm not going to do it, because it's going against what I hold to be true. I've never done that kind of stuff. I see this in myself sometimes. You know, I'll share this with you guys. I'm like Peter. And I think a lot of us in this room, we can identify with Peter. Because I'm still a work in progress. God is still working on me. I'm getting older. I have my kids. One is graduated now. The other one's still in high. You know, this, God's still working on me. I still make mistakes. I mean, I still have things that I look at that are probably wrong. You know, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. There's still times in my life where I say, by no means, Lord. <laughs> As if that's going to make it better because I added more to the by no means. It, no, that doesn't make it better. Just adding more to no. Because that's really what Peter's saying, no, but more. Just because you add more to your no, it doesn't make the no any better. But I find myself, I do that at times where I say, no, Lord. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that thing that you called me to do. And I have to repent and I have to go back and say, you know what? I responded in the wrong way. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm going to do what you called me to do. So like Peter, I mean, we see here, he's a work in progress. He's had these deeply held beliefs that the Lord is now challenging and saying, no, Peter, we're going to, look, I'm doing something different. You don't understand right now. I'm doing something different. And the Lord is challenging these deeply held beliefs that Peter has. And Peter's saying, no, Lord. But Peter, I mean, when the Lord tells him to do something, Peter, God gets Peter's attention. Because Peter might not have initially responded in the right way here. But the Lord uses this vision to prepare him for the next step. Because there's really four steps that go on. And what's the next step? The next step is very simple. In verse 11, and behold. So as he's meditating on this, behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to meet from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered this man's home. The Spirit told Peter, hey, go with these guys. And what, what, what does Peter do? He's obedient. When was the last time that the Spirit told you to do something that was just absolutely like, that's not something I want to do? I remember, like, I'll give you an example. It was a long time ago. I have, I have more recent ones, but this was probably one of the first times where I, I had to learn to trust the Lord. I went to Mexico. Daniel had gone the previous year. I went this year. I had, we had some youth with us. And we were in El Refugio. And John Avila comes up and says, Hey, Eli, you're going to do devotions this morning. And so I'm praying about it. Okay, I'm going to do devotions. And I feel like, okay, I got a devotion. I'm going to do this devotion. And there's stairs that go up and you turn, and then there's the room. And so as I'm taking my first step up the stairs to go to this room to do devotions, the Lord says, you're not doing that devotion. Wait. <laughs> I have literally 30 seconds here. I'm not doing this devotion that I'm prepared for? Are you serious? God, right, right now, you're going to tell me 30 seconds before I'm going to give this devotion that I'm not doing this devotion? He says, no. Here's what I want you to say. I want you to say, there's somebody in here that needs to repent. I want you to pull a chair out and, and just have a chair. So I walk up there, everybody, there's like, 30 people in there because there's a team and there's the Mexico team. That's so why I pull this chair. I put it down. I say, there's somebody here that needs to repent. Somebody, somebody here needs to repent. We need to pray for you. You know what happens? Nothing. Everybody's just sitting there. And I'm questioning in my head, was that you, Lord, or am I just crazy? Like, nobody's coming to sit in this chair. This is a failure! Lord, you failed! I probably wait. It felt like I waited for like five minutes. You know, in your mind when you're like, 
doing something and not, it's just not working. And that time just seems to like extend and drag on and on. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is just terrible. What is going on? Maybe I should go back to that devotion that I had prepared. Well, there's this guy. He was part of the Mexico group that was there. And all of a sudden, he just started crying. His name, I, he was like, you, you look at Daniel. That Daniel was ripped. Like, Daniel's ripped. This guy was like one of those Greek gladiators. I mean, he was huge. He owned a shop there in Mexico, a surf shop. He was like one of these surfer guys, just absolutely the biggest guy you've ever, I want to say his name was Leonidas like that, because he looked like Leonidas. And it, he just starts weeping, just like, Rah! just crying. And I was like, what is going on? And he, he just comes and he sits in that chair and he says, you have to pray for me. It's me, you have to pray for me. Every single one of us, the 29 others of us around that room, we all went around and laid hands on him. And every single person is praying for this guy. One of the most intense prayer times that I've ever had being on a mission trip. Maybe there's some, some that are pretty intense in Nepal, but it was super intense, like the Lord was doing something in that guy's heart that never would have happened had I done the original thing that I wanted to do. But when I stepped out in faith and I listened to the Holy Spirit's prompting in my life, even when I couldn't understand, like seriously, your devotion is this, someone needs prayer. That's your devotion? Eli, come, God, come on, that can't be the right devotion. But that was the devotion. Somebody needs prayer, somebody needs to repent. Here's a chair. Who is it? Wow. And all of a sudden, the Lord starts moving and doing something exceedingly abundantly above all I could have ever asked or thought. We gave room for the Lord to move, and the Lord moved. It's just such an encouragement to me that, man, when the, when the Spirit tells us to do something, we have to respond in obedience. And so God speaks to this guy, speaks to Peter through the Holy Spirit. And as the Spirit speaks, Peter says, you know what? I don't understand what I'm doing, but I'm going to go. I'm going to be obedient, and I'm going to go. God did it, and it's so funny because God wasn't just preparing Peter, but God was preparing Cornelius for this entire event. I don't know that guy. I don't know how God was preparing him, but obviously for him to just break down like that, God was working on his heart. There must have been some situations or things that had gone on. Like John knew who he was. I didn't know who he was. But God must have been working on him. And just like God is working on him, God is working on Peter, God's working on Cornelius. Notice what happens, verse 13. As they entered Cornelius' house, that Cornelius told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. The angel told this guy, Hey, send for Peter. Peter has a message. You're going, to be, you're going to hear this message and you're going to believe and be saved. It's going to lead to salvation for you and not only you, but for anybody who's in your household. And so what does Cornelius do? I love Cornelius. He knows Peter's coming. He knows this guy's coming. And so he goes out and invites people. Hey, guys, the truth will be at my house tomorrow. Be there. And if you read back in Acts chapter 10, you see that not only his household, but his close friends listened to this and they came to his house. His close friends were like, the truth is going to be at Cornelius' house. I want to go see what this is all about. And so they go to Cornelius' house, and all these guys are there. They all gather. Friends, family, they come out. They want to hear what is true. They want to hear how to be saved. And so as Peter gets in there, and he tells them, hey, it's unlawful. Let me start my sermon by saying it's unlawful for me to be here right now. But I'm just going to go, why did you send for me? I'm going to, well, let me just tell you a little bit about Jesus. You already know about him, but I'm going to tell you about him. And it's almost like he didn't want to be there. <laughs> and then look. Look at what happens. Verse 15 says this. Peter is telling these guys, he says, As I began to speak, or as I was still speaking, and we know that his sermon was cut short, as he was speaking, what happened? The Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. God sends the Holy Spirit. Peter was telling them about Jesus, telling them how they could be saved, and the whole, they believe that the Holy Spirit is falling on these guys in a powerful way. God takes action. He fills these young Gentiles with the Spirit. As they believe in Him, He fills them with the Spirit. It's an amazing event. Why? Why is this event so amazing? Because 
God is saying there is no other requirement to come to me. You do not have to become a Jew to come to me. You don't have to start following all these rules and regulations. You don't have to become circumcised in order to come to me. All are welcome to come to me. Jew, Samaritan, Gentile, we're all the same. Every single one of us is lost and needs a savior. Everyone, all are welcome at the cross. And only by believing in Jesus can we be saved. Paul would later write in Romans 10, 9. I won't give you Romans 5, 8 this week. Romans 10, 9. It says this. Paul writes, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what Paul writes. And that's what's happening here in Cornelius' home. These guys are believing that Jesus is God, that he died and rose again for their sins, and they're radically saved. And it's evident to everyone because as they're radically saved, God fills them with the Spirit, giving them the same signs that happened back at Pentecost for the Jews. See, the thing is that we're all sinners. Our sin separates us from a holy God. And I love Cornelius' story because you saw Cornelius, he had every avenue of idol, every avenue of gods before him, and he searched through them, and he could find no answer. None of them would satisfy him, and so he started to look into Judaism. As he's sitting here in Caesarea, and he starts to pray to God, Lord, would you reveal yourself to me? If you're true, reveal yourself to me. He starts to give alms to the poor. Cornelius, just like us, they go through many different things. I mean, you can read the book of Ecclesiastes if you want to. You can see Solomon, the wisest man on the planet. He went through so many different things. Which one of these things is going to satisfy me? Cornelius, even all, the, all these years later, is asking the same question. Which one of these little gods is going to satisfy me? And the answer is none of them do. He can't. There's none. None will satisfy. I mean, we take the same path today. We search through so many different things saying, what is going to satisfy us? Is it going to be money? Is it going to be power? Is it going to be friends? Is it going to be Facebook likes? What is it going to be that's going to satisfy this longing in my heart? And we have to answer the same as Cornelius. As we search through all these things, they're all empty. None of them satisfy. None of those things satisfy because there's only one thing that will satisfy, and that's Jesus Christ. That's only one thing that will work. And at some point, all of us come to this realization where we encounter God. And you've heard my story. I encountered God as I was washing Lorelai, who was like two or three years old, in a bathtub. And now she's 18. Like I can't. She's like the skinniest little thing. Back then, she was the Michelin baby, and I'm washing her. I'm just crying. She doesn't even remember. She's just so happy to have like a little bath. And then that moment, I'm meeting the Lord. I'm saying, Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. Please forgive me for all those years that I've wasted, all that time that I was just serving myself. I'm repenting of those things, Lord. Would you just make me the man that you created me to be? Would you heal my daughter? Would you, would you allow me to love my wife the way that she needs to be loved? Would you heal our marriage? Lord, what would you have me do? Do the laundry. So what are you going to do? When you reach out to God and you're repenting in that moment, you hear the voice of the Lord just comforting your heart and he's asking you to do the laundry. What are you going to do? You're going to go do the laundry. It reminds, I, was, I felt like Naaman looking back on it, right? Where, go dip in the Jordan. What? <laughs> Who wants to dip it? I'm dipped in the Jordan. It is a dirty river. You want, like, when you... I don't want to willingly go dip in the Jordan. Mike and Kim are going to get to willingly dip in the Jordan, you know. I didn't want, it's dirty, it's just, it's brown. It's brown. And it's freezing cold when I was there. And then one of the servants goes to Naaman and says, hey, if, if that man of God had asked you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Wouldn't you do some great thing if God asked you to do it? Yeah, you would do some great thing if God asked you to do it. So why not just do the little thing? What's so hard about doing that little thing? Why don't you go dip in the Jordan? To see what the Lord's going to do. And so I do the laundry, and the Lord heals our marriage. The Lord heals Lorelai. The Lord does all this amazing things. I'm just like, wow. Who would have thought that that's the path that would have been? Because see, at some point, we all come to face to face with God, and we have to make a choice. Are we going to follow him? Are we going to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I repent of those things I've done wrong. Or are we going to say, nah, Lord, whatever. 
I'm going to keep going my own way. Keep going my own way. And so many of us, we keep going our own way. The challenge would be for you to repent. Stop going your own way. Repent and come to the Lord. Make Him Lord of your life. And that's the challenge before any of us. Lord, forgive me a sinner. Lord, would you do something in my life? Because here's the reality that when we come to the Lord, and if that's you, if you need to come to the Lord, come talk to me. Talk to Pastor Clay. Talk to one of the elders. We'd love to share with you. But at some point, when we come to the Lord, the Lord does something amazing. He does something amazing in Cornelius' life. The Lord does something amazing in my life. The Lord done something amazing. I know if we sat here and said, let's give our testimonies around this room, we would hear testimony after testimony of how the Lord has done something amazing in your lives. Because that's what the Lord does. And I'm going to tell you right now, the Lord's not done yet. He hasn't finished. You're still here. He's still working. God is active. He's still working. He's still doing amazing things in our lives. See, God has worked in these Gentile believers in an amazing way. Peter is absolutely shocked. And now he's faced with a choice. What is he going to do as the Spirit of God is falling on these guys? I love these next two verses. I love these next two verses because they tell us, verse 16 and 17, they tell us Peter's thinking as he's walking into this. What is he thinking as he's walking into this? Read with me. And he says this. And I remember, as I was sitting there seeing this amazing event, I remembered in my head the word of the Lord. How he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Who was I? Look at what, look at what he's really saying here. He's remembering the very first thing. He says, yeah, John baptized with water, but it is God who baptizes with the Spirit. It's only, I can't go and say, hey, be baptized with the Spirit and somebody's going to get baptized. No, 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 no. It's God who baptizes people with the Spirit when they believe in Him. It, that's God's work. God does it. So Peter, sitting there remembering, this work that I'm seeing right before me is not of man. This work of the Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit is nothing to do with man and everything to do with God. Everything to do with their relationship with God. That they've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's evident because God has poured out His Spirit on them. It's a work of God. And then second, as he's looking at this, he's saying that God has done this work. Giving the Gentiles a gift of the Holy Spirit without first con having them convert to Judaism. And if that was what God was going to do, Peter tells these Judaizers, Who am I? Who am I? that I'm going to stand in God's way. There's no way that I can stop the thing of God. There's no way that I'm going to stand in God's way. I love Peter's thoughts. Because he doesn't fully understand what God is doing. He's just like, this is just radical, man. It's, it's challenging all my beliefs as a Jewish man about how people come to God. It's just challenging that completely. But I'm not going to stand in God's way. If God is doing something new, I'm going to follow the Lord. When God does the work, Peter is going to follow. And it's an encouragement to me, an encouragement to us that when God is moving, we need to follow. We need to be the ones that say, man, Lord, I'm going to go wherever you're going, even if I don't understand what's going on right now. I need to trust God regardless of what I think should happen. Because there's so often, I mean, talking about Nepal, we have a meeting this afternoon with the doctors, dentists, and all of us that are going. And we go with the plan. We say, okay, well, here's what we plan on doing. Well, in Nepal, they just passed a law that you cannot talk about Jesus anymore. They hate Christianity in Nepal. And so it gets hard to do clinics. It gets hard to do these things. The government at any moment could come and just shut us down and say, you guys are Christians. You're out of here. You're done. They can do that. And so we go with the plan, but God has a plan for us when we're there. And God always has done exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or thought, even when it doesn't happen how we thought it should happen. And so how do the leaders respond? It's interesting. It's the leaders' response is right there in verse 18. <clears throat> they say, when they heard these things, they fell silent. They started to think about these things that Peter had been telling them. They fell silent. And then what did they do? They glorified God, saying, that to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. They stop questioning Peter, and they start glorifying God because God is doing a new work. I love what, the, you want to know what is going on, you go look at J. Vernon McGee. I love that guy. He says this, even the Judaizers had to shut their mouths now. 
They had nothing more to say in objection because obviously this was of God. So their only option was to glorify God. The question of Gentiles and salvation has been answered right here in this moment. But it, guess what? Just because it was answered here, it doesn't mean it's going to end here. You guys know anything about the New Testament, the book of Acts, and even through the epistles, we're going to see that the Judaizers continue to come against the Gentiles, and they continue to ask the question, do the Gentiles need to do more to come to the Lord? Do they need to do more? Do they need to follow the law? Do they need to be circumcised? And the answer has always been no. The Gentiles don't need to do anything else. Just like everyone else, all anyone has to do is believe in Jesus. What he has done for you, make him Lord of your life. And so here's Peter. He's the apostle. He was there when the Spirit fell on the Jews there in Pentecost. He was there laying hands on the Samaritans and watching the Spirit fall on them. He's there as now the Gentiles receive the Spirit. He's been there for all three of these people groups. And now this foundation of this early church has been laid. The foundation is laid. The gospel is now ready to go out into all the world. What Jesus said, or what John wrote back there, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved the world that whosoever believes. And the whosoever now includes Jews. The whosoever now includes Samaritans. The whosoever now includes Gentiles. The rest of the known world. Any one of these people groups can come to the Lord. All are welcome. The gospel's ready to go out. And so now we see this great transition in the book of Acts. We've seen Peter, the apostle to the Jews. And this, there's going to be a transition from Peter to Paul as the, as the word goes out into the entire world. And how does that happen? It happens very simply right here. Read with me in verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as uh, Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. I think it's interesting because there's unnamed people that go out. You guys remember the persecution? Seven years have now passed. The persecution, this church, these disciples have slowly spread, 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 spread out. And they're going out amongst all the people. And who are they, who are they telling? Well, they're telling the Jews, come to the Lord. Jesus is Lord. He died for your sins. God uses these regular guys to continue to spread the gospel amongst the Jewish world. And so here in this young church in Antioch, they get to Antioch. Antioch is one of the three major cities in the Roman Empire. Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch were the three major cities. Wiersbe says this about Antioch. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Half a million people. It was a center of luxury and culture with all kinds of people from every corner of the empire. Antioch was called the Golden Queen of the East. Jews, Romans, Greeks, every known people would gather to Antioch. It was a beautiful place of luxury. It's where the Roman people would go to retire. Get out of Rome. They didn't want to be in Rome. They would go retire in Antioch. That's where they wanted to go. Is that again, all kinds of sin and idols were there. there. But it was a very beautiful place. They were known for a colonnade. It was super long. They didn't wind it with marble columns. It was just an amazing city. The disciples get to the city. Seven years have gone past. They start to come to Antioch now. And as they get to Antioch, they start to share with the Jews, Hey! Don't worry about all this other stuff that you see. Jesus is the way. Don't worry about all the gambling. Don't worry about all the luxury. Jesus is the way. And there's some Jews that are believing. And then something radical happens. There's some men. They start to witness to the Greek-speaking people. They just go out and start witnessing. You know, maybe they had heard what happened with Peter and the Gentiles. And so they said, hey, we're going to go witness. The Bible doesn't tell us. But regardless of if they had heard or not, they go out. The Lord had obviously told them, go talk to these Greek-speaking people. He gave them opportunity. He gave them an open door. And so they were going out and speaking to these Greek-speaking people. And as they speak to these Greek-speaking people, all of a sudden, they're getting radically saved. What's going on? The Gentiles respond. A great number turned to the Lord. God's using these unnamed regular people, regular guys, regular ladies, to share the good news with their neighbors and friends. And there's people radically being saved. A great number are saved. And man, 
It's a reminder to me. Be available. That I need to be available and at times take risks. When God is telling me to do something, I might not understand what he's doing. But I need to be available and go and do it. And so the church in Jerusalem, they hear about this large group of Gentiles. And what do they do? Verse 22. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came, he saw the grace of God. He was glad and exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. I think it's so interesting because Barnabas, he's glad to see these Gentiles responding in faith to Jesus Christ. He gets there and he's just stoked. Look at what God is doing in this city. This is absolutely amazing. Where's he says again, he says, Barnabas rejoiced at what he saw. Worshiping with the Gentiles was a new experience for Barnabas, but he approached it positively, did not look for things to criticize. His attitude and excitement gave him this increased ability to shepherd this young church in Antioch. I mean, I love that he's a voice of encouragement to these young believers. If you notice, maybe it sounds familiar. These young believers are surrounded by every luxury imaginable. Antioch was a place where anything was available for them. Every luxury in the culture was imaginable. That's imaginable was available to these guys. And so what does Barnabas encourage these guys to do? Do you notice what it says? He says, remain faithful to the Lord. Because you guys all know, Jesus talked about, he said there's a sower that goes out and sows seed, right? Some are going to fall on the path. Some are going to fall on the rocky soil. And what's the third one? Some fall where? The choking thorns. Because why? The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches will choke out that faith. Because you want to go back to that world of riches. You want to go back to that world of just stuff. It's so appealing. And so Barnabas sits there and says, A, remain faithful to the Lord. Be steadfast. Be immovable in this purpose. Don't be moved from left to right. Right? Be faithful to the Lord. See, the thing is, it would be easy to go back to a life of luxury. Who wants a life of luxury? Oh, hey. It's why there's preachers out there that they gather huge followings, because that's what they say. You want a life of luxury? Come. Have faith, and you know God's going to... Health, wealth, prosperity is going to be awesome for you. Oh, well, it's not happening? Well, I'm sorry, you just don't have enough faith for it to be happening in your life. Just have a little bit more faith, brother. Just have a little bit more faith, sister. And all that stuff is going to come to you. It's so appealing to us. We, all the stuff. But Barnabas says, watch out. There's deceit over here. There's deceitfulness of riches over here. Remain faithful to God. Remain faithful to Jesus Christ. Be steadfast in this purpose. And how do we do that? We do it by loving the Lord. Right? Jesus says, what are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord and love who? Who? Others. Love the Lord. Love others. That's what he says. He says, love the Lord. Love others. Put into practice the things that you hear, not only on a Sunday morning, but the things that you hear in your devotional time. Read the Word. Read some devotionals. What are you hearing? What is God showing you to do? Well, put that into practice. Put it into practice. Grow to be more like Christ. I mean, it's easy for these guys to go back to the comfort of the world, but look at what happens. They don't. They don't go back to the comfort of the world. They sit there, and the Lord grows the church. It's absolutely amazing. This amazing work going on. The Lord is growing the church, and Barnabas is there, and this work is becoming too big for him. And so what does Barnabas do? I love what Barnabas does. The work is becoming so great. And in verse 25, it says this. So Barnabas went. This work is becoming too big for him. So he went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. He goes to find Saul. We know that this transition is going to be happening between Peter and Saul. And so here Saul is coming back into the picture. How does he come back? He comes back as an assistant to Barnabas. Barnabas goes and finds him and says, The Lord is doing an amazing work among the Gentiles. I know that you're called because, man, you told me your testimony back in Jerusalem seven years ago. I know that you're called. And so why don't you just come? Come with me and assist in this work, this great work that God is doing in Antioch. And so... Saul comes, Paul comes, 
And as they come, this wild, you guys remember him. I showed you the picture right there on the screen. The tiger that was eating that rabbit. That I took that picture in the zoo. That was a fun picture, but that was Saul. Because the word that's talking, that's used to describe him is a wild animal that mauls prey. That was Saul, this wild animal of a man, and he's coming. He's out coming as an assistant to Barnabas to teach these guys the truth about Jesus and truth about his word. And as these people learn to love the Lord, as they learn to obey the things that he reveals in his word, others begin to notice. You know, these disciples, they don't call themselves Christians. It's others who make up that name. Others who are not Christians themselves are seeing these people and they're saying, there is something weird. You guys are different than everyone else. Why aren't you going after all of these pleasures that we've got over here? Why aren't you going to gambling and going to the races and the gladiator? Why aren't you doing all these things? There's something different about you. And they start calling them Christians. And you guys know Christian. We would know it as being a follower of Christ. But it meant something a little bit different to them. It meant this. The name for them meant you were of the people of Christ. You were of the people of Christ. We say follower of Christ. But these they said, no, you are of the people of Christ. You belong to Christ. You're not just a follower, but you belong to Jesus. That's who you are. You belong to someone. You belong to Jesus. There was groups back then. I belong to Caesar. I belong, I'm a, of the people of this and that. And no, but you belong to Jesus. That, that's what they called you. I mean, how do we get that name today? <laughs> we get that name today because maybe we go to church occasionally. I go to church occasionally, so I'll, I'll identify as a Christian. Or I'll just identify as a Christian because that's what I'm going to identify as. The name Christian wasn't something that you identified as. It's something that was given to you because of what was going on around you. They saw that there was a change in your life. They saw that there was something different in you. And so they gave you this name, Christian. How are you different? Well, you love the Lord. How are you different? You obeyed what he said in his word. You didn't go after all these different things that were going on in the culture. You stayed fast and immovable in your purpose of following God. You loved God and you served others. Well, how did you serve others? Luke writes a very practical thing that they did. And well, how does, what does he say? Now in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of, the, one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. These guys loved others by giving. Giving to the Jewish brothers and sisters back in Jerusalem. Each according, do you see what it says? Everyone according to his ability. I mean, this is the principle that Paul would write later on in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. The great principles that he would talk about giving, cheerfully giving. The Lord loves what? A cheerful giver, giving according to your ability. Stott says this, there's ability on one hand, there is need on the other, and how to relate ability and need to each other. These principles should characterize the family of God. I mean, Pastor Rick, he would always tell us, what would he say? He would say, we must be spirit-filled grace givers. He would tell us time after time, when you give, you have to be spirit-filled. You have to do it in a spirit of grace. Giving according to your ability. What is God giving you? Why cheerfully giving? We're just stewards of what God has entrusted us with. It's all the Lord's. And the Lord, here's the thing. When we give to the Lord, the Lord does something. Something absolutely amazing. Something beyond any one of us would be capable of achieving on our own. What do I mean? I mean, how do we partner with the Lord here at Calvary Chapel? We partner with the Lord. We just talked about it this morning. One of the amazing things we do is that outreach in this community, Trunk or Treat, coming up. Pray right now that the school will find favor with the school and let us use the parking lot like they let us use last year. It was amazing. People came out. People were hearing the gospel. Blew my mind. Everybody was having a great time. There was, you guys made so much food. I don't even understand, like, all that food that was there. People were leaving with 
crazy amount of food. There was people that, there was families that came through that didn't want to leave because you guys, the church was giving away so much candy. Like, the kids were like, we don't want to leave. And the parents were like, we need to leave. Look, you have like seven bags of candy. What's going on here? You know your dental bill? We get to partner with what the Lord is doing here in this community. We get to partner every other month we go to River of Life and partner with what the Lord is doing amongst the homeless. That, I mean, it's just crazy. Drive sometime downtown. The homeless in Hawaii is radically out of control. River of Life is doing an amazing job of rehabilitating people, giving them jobs in that place where they make chocolate and then they can sell that stuff and they can get back on their feet. They can start renting a place. They can get a, a better job. It blows my mind the work that River of Life is doing down there. We partner with these guys to impact this community. We partner with the Lord in mission work. I mean, you can look on the back of the bulletin. It talks about the mission work that we partner with the Lord. If you look at this, I mean, we have Hannah goes everywhere. Pastor Joe Mesh is in Nepal. Henry and Darlene, they go from Israel to everywhere across the globe. Zach and Naomi, they impact foreign mission students in Texas that then go across the globe. We have compassion kids in the Polish. I mean, it's crazy. This, I could never do all of that on my own. You could never do all of this on your own. But together, this little church is not only impacting Milani, not only impacting Honolulu, but it's impacting the world. This church, right here, look around to your left and right, the people to your left and right, you are part of impacting this world for Jesus Christ because you, you give out of your ability. That blows my mind, that this little church is part of impacting not only our community, but the world for Jesus Christ. And then, I mean, I have some amazing news with the property. The Lord is really moving with our property. The bankers are giving us great news. One of my, one of my good, I mean, one of my really good friends is an architect. I just found out he's an architect. He's an architect and a pastor. Right down at Calvary Chapel, Pearl Harbor. He's my good friend. I was like, I know you. I know you. You're my good friend. What are you doing here? Oh, I'm meeting you. I'm the architect. You're the architect? James and I are meeting with the architect. Coming up, we're looking to do, I mean, there's a lot of news. And I'm, I wanna see what this architect is gonna come back, pray for him, his name is Corey Boss. C-O-R-E-Y-B-O-S-S, pray for him. That he would catch the vision of what we wanna do up here in Malka. I mean, pray for our bankers, that we can get a loan. I mean, there's all these things are starting to come into place. It was so interesting, because we're talking to these guys we're talking about putting up this building with the architect and with the bankers. And as soon as we do that, we come back and we get a bill from the school and we notice, hey, the school has undercharged us. They didn't charge us for the next two Sundays. And so I tell Pastor Clay, hey, Pastor Clay, just call the school and see why they're not charging us. And so on, on Tuesday or Wednesday, Pastor Clay, this week, Pastor Clay calls the school and the school tells them, oh, yeah, you just can't be. <laughs> what? You're going you're to give us a week's notice that we can't meet? But that's what the school, that's, I mean, this is theirs. This isn't ours, this is the school's. They're, they're doing a bunch of renovation work in here. And so, hey, when they're renovating, we can't meet. And so maybe it's the Lord just giving us this little nudge and saying, hey, I'm doing something. Yeah. Pray about it, start praying, start being able to take risks because I can't, by myself, I can't build a building up in Malka. I can't, there's no, there's no possible way, it's impossible. But together, God can do something amazing. That's what I know. That I can't do it on my own. When I'm standing in the body of Christ, God can do something amazing. Because God is in the business of doing exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I can ask of Him. When each one of us is giving according to our ability. Because that's all that they did back then. They said, okay, Lord, what am I going to give? And spirit-filled grace giving. And they sent this relief all the way up to Jerusalem. God is, I, want, I just want to, encourage you guys this morning that God is using us together to do something beyond what any one of us could do on our own. And it's not just about a building in Malta, but it's about the gospel going forth across this globe. It's about the gospel going forth to people that have never heard. Just so you know, pray for Pastor Joe Nash. 
His church just sent him out. We are now partnering with a brand new church in Nepal. His church sent him out. Yesterday, they had their first service in Nepal. They had five families that came to this first service in Nepal. 20 people were there. And a new church being planted because of what God is doing over there. And we're partnering with that. There's 20, there's 20 new people yesterday heard the gospel because we're partnering with Jamesh to start a church in Nepal. That's this little church. That's us. And you know how much it costs for a church to start in Nepal? I'm going to tell you, it's really cheap. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's nothing for us. For them, it's like a huge step of faith. And Pastor Joe Mesh is sitting there encouraging me, hey, Eli, the Lord's going to do something with those millions of dollars you need. And I encourage him, I say, well, Joe Mesh, the Lord's doing something with the hundreds of dollars that you need. <laughs> you know? But the reality of it is, God is doing something. And so where does that leave us today? I wrote this word up there. As the worship team comes up, as we get ready to close, I wrote this word. This is what impacted me this week. Because this is what I call myself. This is what I say I am. This one. And as I was looking at the study this week, and as I was looking at what I call myself this week, I started to wonder, what do people around me call me? <laughs> what do my neighbors say about me? What do the people that don't know me, when they look at me, what do they say about me? Do they say the same thing? Do my actions back up what I call myself? And so I wanted to encourage you guys this morning. Follow God. Be this word. Don't just call yourself this word. Be this word. Be the people of God. Not just with your mouth, but with your actions. If you look, this really hit me. This is Oswald Chambers I put in the Shepherds of the Sheep this week. It really hit me really hard. He was talking about if you want to be the people of God, you always want to be the people of God out there doing the big thing. When I came to the Lord, that was my first thought. I want to be the person of God out there doing the big thing. What's the big thing, Lord, that you would have me do? And the Lord says, do the laundry. Oswald writes in the Shepherd to the Sheep that if you want to be the people of God, if you want, the, if you want God to use you, you have to be a follower of God underneath your fig tree. When nobody's watching, when it's just you and God. Are you worshiping God when nobody else is there? Are you being a Christian in action? Or are you being a Christian in word only? So the challenge for me this morning was, man, I need to be a Christian, not just in word, but in deed, in truth, following the Lord in my private life, having my devotions, getting into his word, having that prayer time with God that's so vital for moving forward in, in life. And when you're in relationship with God in that way, there's going to be valleys. And I know, I don't know all the valleys that you guys are in, but I know that you guys go through valleys. Why? Because I think you're just like me. I go through valleys. And so if you guys are like me, if you guys are like Peter, then you go through battles. God's with you in the battle. God's leading you in the battle. And there's also going to be times, and I'm going to get to see those times of those mountain times, where God does something exceedingly abundantly above all that you could have asked or thought. And it's because of Christ Jesus, it's because of your relationship with Him that you're working and you're seeing God do something amazing in your private life. And as you do follow Him in your private life, He starts doing something amazing. He starts doing exceedingly abundantly above anything you could ask of him. And so the challenge and encouragement for you today, think about this word. Don't just say this word this week. Live this this week. So Father, we commit ourselves to you. We thank you, Lord, that you are God, that you do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. I thank you for Calvary Chapel of Central Oahu, Lord, that together, Lord, <laughs> Each one of us giving out of our ability. Lord, you are impacting the world. That This little church, you are impacting the world. That blows, I mean, you're impacting our community. I know I've seen it. But Lord, you're impacting Nepal. You're impacting Middle Eastern countries. You're impacting places in Israel. You're doing something amazing across the globe just out of this little church. 
That blows my mind. So Lord, we just thank you that you have called us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for the cross. And so God, would you really minister, up, minister to us this week? Help us to meditate on that word Christian and not just call ourselves that, but Lord, live that in reality. Lord, following you with everything that we are, pursuing you. So God, go before us. We commit ourselves to you. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you guys stand up? We'll do one last song together. And I will see you guys in study this week. Or if not, I'll see you.